Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Russell I'm an alcoholic. I'm a member of the uh, Carl Gables Group, and it's good to be here. I haven't done enough to have a drink since January 25th, 1981. Yeah, it's been a while. I forget sometimes. So it's good to be here. And uh, I have a little something I really, you know, on my heart to maybe talk about. And uh, we'll see how it goes. I uh, came a day a little bit, almost 34 years ago, to stop drinking. Uh... If you want to stop drinking, A is probably a good place to go. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous, it's in the name. It's probably the primary deal. <coughs> AA, uh, apparently not drinking is like really important in Alcoholics Anonymous. Have you all noticed that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a big deal. They hand out all these chips, these medallions during your first year, and then they have birthday night, and it's a wonderful thing. But somehow, uh, I'm not sure when I started realizing that there was more. I'm not sure when it really. I, I'm not sure when it really dawned upon me that there was more than just not drinking. Uh, that that I'm not sure when it totally dawned upon me that not drinking can actually be a very painful experience. I'm not sure whether it really when it dawned on me that things can get pretty crappy when you're not drinking. It can be crappy when you're drinking. It can be crappy when you're not drinking. Uh, you know, they have that saying in A that we tell newcomers. My worst day sober is not, isn't better than my best day drunk. Is that, anybody ever heard that? Well, that's a lie. <laughs> if you don't know that's a lie, then you have just not been around here long enough. Hey, that's, listen, listen. That's, it's, listen. It, it, there's a time and a place for every A. So a says a lot of stuff. A lot of bait and switch stuff. It's cool. You know what I mean? It'll get you where you want to go. Like they say this line in the, what do they say in the sixth step? We don't want to deprecate material achievement. You know, they say that in the sixth step. The step that separates the men from the boys. I think it's the sixth or seventh. I'm not sure they say it. We don't want to deprecate material achievement. And they're, what they're trying to get you to focus on is God only and not worry about things. So they say, we don't want to put down material achievement. But then like two sentences later, they say, no, no type of person has made a worse mess of living their lives based upon, you know, seeking romance, money, property, or romance. So in one sense, they say, we don't want to put down material achievement. On the other hand, they say, but for you, you better stay away from it. <laughs> so in AA, we have a way of saying things to people, you know, like don't worry about the God thing, and then the whole thing's about God, you know. <laughs> you know, your worst, you know, when somebody's going through something, hey, listen, your worst day sober, the less day drunk. No, no, things can be pretty bad. It can be pretty bad when you're when it's three o'clock in the morning, and you got four kids, and your house is being foreclosed on, and you got fifty dollars in the bank, you know where the money's going from, and you are as sober as a judge, and you got no idea where the money's coming from. Things get pretty bad when you got when you get when you get a check and you deposit it in order to put money in, in your car for gas, and all of a sudden the check bounces that the guy gave you, or you know you get fired from a job, or or how about I was like when three bad things happen to you at the same time. <laughs> You know, I'm one of these guys, like, I can handle one thing, you know, and I can handle one thing pretty good. I can handle two things. I can balance two things. But you get three plates spinning at the same time, you know, this happens, that happens, and the boss fires me, and my wife screams at me, you know what I mean? And that's, and I'm going psychotic, you know. I mean, there's, there's a point at which I break, you know, that kind of thing. So things can get pretty uh, difficult, you know. In the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, I have it here, I'll, I'll open it up if I need it, but... In the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it, it talks about the men and women being dry at the moment. It says, being dry at the moment, it says, I don't miss it. You know, feel better, looking better, having a better time. He says, we smile at such Sally. We know he'll, he'll, he'll try the old game again, inwardly give anything, take a few drinks to get away with it, because he's not, he's not happy with his sobriety. 
whatever that means, to be happy with your sobriety. You, know, you can be sober and be very unhappy. You know, we have examples of people in the news today that were sober for a time and were very unhappy. And they were extremely unhappy. There's a line in the, uh, uh, in the big book, in the third edition. There's a story in third edition called Outbox Anonymous Number 3. I don't think it's, it's not in the first edition. It's a story about Bill Dotson. Bill Dotson was the man on the bed. Anybody ever seen the picture of the man on the bed? He's sitting there on the bed, and there's Bill Wilson, Dr. Bob. He's the third guy in Outbox Anonymous. He was a lawyer. And uh, he, uh, he was really at the end of his rope, and they came up to him. They used the Bible because between 1935 and 19... 39, that's what, that was the source, that was the source material for Alcoholics Anonymous. In the book Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, it says the books that they found absolutely essential were 1 Corinthians 13, Sermon on the Mount, and the book of James. And, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the book of James down the road, uh, regarding what I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, but in any event, in, and they, they, and they 12 stepped, I don't know what they called it, 12, they didn't call it 12 step at the time. They went up to, uh, Bill Dotson while he was sitting on the bed with the Bible and they spoke to him, you know, the way we speak to people. And he was the third guy who got sober in AA. So he writes a story called, uh, called Alcoholics Anonymous Number Three. It's in your big book. In the story, he was about a few weeks sober. He was right out of the hospital and he was sitting in his, uh, kitchen with his wife, Henrietta. And what he says in the story is that Bill Wilson was there, and this is the way he frames it, and, and I'll, I'll, I don't have it in front of me, so I'll try to do it from memory the best way I, I, I can. He says, I knew there was something more. Now, he was sober three or four weeks out of the hospital, and he was sitting there, and he's watching Bill Wilson. He says, I knew there was something more, something I hadn't got, something a person ought to have, and I wanted it. I knew there was something more, something I hadn't got, Something I had in God, and I wanted that deal. I wanted to find out why they had this release, this happiness, this something of thought a person ought to have. You know, so often in Outbox Anonymous, I'm confronted with people, and they can have, I, I was, I, I've been confronted with people that have 30 years plus, and 30 days plus, that are sad. They're just sad. They're just, I'm telling you, they're just pathetic. I don't say that, but they're just, they're just unbelievably in a state of, of self-pity. You know, it's like life is weighing on them. They are not, they are not, you know, the big book says we have found much of heaven and we have been rocketed into the fourth dimension of existence of which we had not even dreamed. And I'm going to, I got to tell you this. They're not talking about the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. They're not talking about the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous that I know of. They're not talking about this fellowship, the joy of heaven, the rocket ship and the, and the, and the, I mean, listen, one or two, three or four here and there. And so Bill Dotson says, he looks around, he says, uh, he says, I looked at these guys and I said they had such a release, they had such a happiness, they had such a thing, something I thought a person ought to have and I was trying to find the answer. I was trying to find out how they got this deal. I remember going to AA meetings, trying to figure out how to get that deal. I mean, I was sober, you know, and, and every once in a while I'd have a good time, and every once in a while I'd have fun, and I would laugh, and, you know, I'd have my friends, and and it wasn't a horrible experience, but I didn't have, I knew there was something more. I knew there was something. I used to follow people around, you know, AA speakers, you know, Joe Snyder, Eddie Edwards, you know, different guys around. Because I would spot these guys that had that deal. I would spot the guys that had the deal. I knew there was something where I would spot these guys. And I would follow them around to AA meetings. And I'd listen to them. Because I think that maybe I'd, I'd get the secret. You know, I'd hear the secret. Like maybe I'd go to a meeting, you know what I mean? And they would say something. And I'd walk out and I'd have it. You know, and it, whatever the heck they had. So they no longer were scared that no longer had anxiety, no longer couldn't get to sleep at night because they were worried about the money, no longer, no longer worried about what other people thought about them, no longer worried about what was going to happen in the future, no, worry, no longer worried about what, what I did last week, 
those voices, you're a piece of crap, you know, you ought to be dead, would go away, you know, all the condemning voices, all the guilt, all the crap. I figured I'd go to a meeting, and I, I'd listen to one of these guys, and somehow I'd get it. You know what I mean? Not just the not drinking thing. I had the not drinking thing down, but I get the not thinking, the feeling good about myself thing, or whatever that thing is they had that I never had, and uh, it didn't happen for me. It didn't happen. Not for many, many, many years. It didn't happen. And uh, I went to... Uh, I remember going to a meeting early on by, uh, I mean, listen, life for alcohol, al men and women drink because they like the effect produced by alcohol. They're restless, they're irritable, they're discontented, they're selfish, they're self-centered, they're driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking. You know, I mean, they, they got, they, they, they got issues. Alcoholics, <laughs> this is not, this is not by any means well people's anonymous. <laughs> I used to go to my sponsor and I'd complain about the people in AA. He says, well, Russell, you must have thought you were joining. Well, people's anonymous. <laughs> no, I don't think so. You know, I used to complain about the people in AA. I want some, and 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 you know, complain about the people in AA. Can you imagine? Can you even imagine that? You know, there's a lot of crazy people in AA. Now, I'm going to tell you, that's that's either the good news or the bad news, depending upon how you look at it. Now, I'm going to tell you even worse news. There's more crazier people out there. <laughs> I'm serious, and they don't have a program. They're not even trying to work a program. You know what I mean? There's some good ones. You know what I mean? There's some really crazy shit going on out there. You know? And guess what? This is the only planet we got. This is it. You know? I know you want to move. Yeah, I know you figured that's the answer. If you move, but there's only one problem. Wherever you go, you're probably going to be going with you. <laughs> there is a possibility. That as crazy as we are and as crazy as people are out there, there's a possibility that there may be a problem with me. You know, we have a spiritual axiom here. Whenever you're disturbed, no matter what the cause, there's something wrong with you. So I went to a, I went to a, uh, I went to a, a meeting. And you know, just because I stopped drinking doesn't mean I didn't, I stopped thinking. And my best thinking is my sponsor say got me in here. So I remember I went to, uh, my sponsor told me I ought to join a group. I ought to join a home group. So I immediately said, I said, well, what group do you belong to? He says, ah, you wouldn't like my group. You know, so I said, so I, I so immediately, I was sensitive, you know, I'm sensitive, but you didn't want me to join, you know. I said, I'm sensitive. He says, no, Russ, great artists are sensitive. You're just touchy. But, but he said, well, you're joining a group. So I went around looking, so I go to this place called the South Dade Room in Dade County. And I walk in, I'm brand new. I've got like, you know, a month or two or so. What well, is that? You know, and I walk in. And I sit where newcomers sit, like all the way to the back of the room. I mean, if I was any farther back, I'd be inside the wall. And, uh, and you know, I'm sort of like hoping that somebody there will recognize me for the genius I am and elect me president of Outbox Anonymous or, you know, as long as they don't ask me to talk because I'm not ready, you know. And, you know, I mean, you know I'm, I'm, I, in one sense, I'm a piece of crap. On the other sense, I'm the greatest in the world. they they got to sort of put that together. And, and I'm looking at the, uh, the people that are all sitting at tables, you know. They had tables set up. And there were like three people at this table and three people at that table and four people at that table. And you know, they're like, you know, they're doing like that A thing, those little click thing, you know, where they're all laughing and joking, you know, and, you know, I'm waiting for somebody to come up and introduce themselves to me because I'm sure it's all not going to introduce themselves to, you know, to, you know, and nobody does it. And the meeting starts and it goes around the room and there, and, and, the, and the speaker, I think he was calling on people. He said, Fred, what are you out to say? And Joe, what are you out to say? And like nobody called on me. And so after the meeting, I, I left the meeting and, you know, and I'm sitting back there saying, you know, I'm saying love and tolerance is our code, you know, the newcomers are most important, what a bunch of bullshit, you know, and, and uh, I mean, real, real stupid, shit. you know, I, and I go, I go to my, so he said, how'd you, how'd you like the meeting at the South Dade room? And so I told them, I told them the truth, you know, the, the truth. I mean, I didn't lie, I told them the truth. They said, it's, it's bullshit. The whole meeting's bullshit. Everybody in there is bullshit. <laughs> they're a bunch of, they're a bunch of phony bullshit artists, you know. I mean, you know, the, the newcomers supposed to be, I sat there in the back, they're all sitting there in their little cliques. They're all, you know, saying, you know, they're all laughing and Joe, nobody came up to me. You know, nobody introduced themselves. They didn't have me talk, you know, nothing, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, I mean, it's all bullshit. It was all uh, talk, no act, you know, I mean, it's a bunch of crazy bullshit group. And so he looks at me and he says, he says, uh, well, I'll tell you what I want you to do. He says, uh, 
I'd like to go back to that group, and I want you to join one of those cliques. So I said, what are you talking about? He says, I want you to go back to the group, and you pick one of the cliques, and you join. You know, just <laughs> join the clique. So I, you know, that's why. So I, I was still at that stage where I was actually worried about drinking. Being fear to, being a fear to drinking is a real good thing, because it'll have you do crap. See, if you're not scared of drinking, you, you, you just get another sponsor. You don't do any of that shit, you know. <laughs> go back to the group, I get another sponsor. This guy's weird, you know. But when you're scared of, when you're scared of drinking, you will do stuff, you know what I mean? You know, you will do crazy stuff, you know, and stuff that no self-respecting alcoholic will ever do. So I was still at that stage where I was scared of drinking. So I went back to the group, same group, same time, and uh, and I, I went up to one of the tables and I said, my name's Russell, I'm brand new. And he says, oh, hey, man, sit down. And they sat down. One guy got me a cup of coffee. The other guy shook my hand. They said, hey, why don't you do the meeting? I said, really? He says, I'm only got like a mic. no, no, you can do the meeting. So it was like a little discussion. I said something. Who knows what I said? It went around. Everything that happened. They said, hey, man, you were great. Hey, keep coming back and everything like that. And they shook my hand. And I said, that was fantastic, Russell. And thanks a lot for coming and thanks for sharing. And I got up and I walked out and I saw my, I saw my sponsor later on that day. He says, so how was me? He says, he says, I said, that's a fantastic group. <laughs> he said, that I told him, I said, I think they had a whole different, whole different number of people. I think they were, the people were all different, you know? And, uh, and, and you see, and well, the only thing that changed in that group was me. I'm the only thing that, you see, the truth is, when I first walked in there, that was the most horrible group in the world. Now the truth is, when I walked in there the next time, it was the greatest group in the world. And the only thing that changed was me and my attitude. And I walk into it one day, he tells me to go back to some group, and he says, this guy speaking, he's a really good speaker. So I sit there, and the guy says, my name's Joe, and I'm, uh, uh, and I'm a recovered alcoholic. So, you know, I've been to, you know, maybe what, who knows, you know, 20 meetings by that time. I mean, I was an expert, and I knew that there was no cure for this disease. You couldn't be cured for this disease, you know, and I, I knew I, I had heard that I was a recovering alcoholic. I am recovering. I am always recovering. I know there is no recovered. I was recovering, you know, and so all through the meeting, I'm saying, you know, there's, this guy's such a liar. He, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's, he's telling people they can be cured. He's, he's killing people. Somebody ought to raise their hand and say, this guy's a phony. And blah, 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 and this, that, and the other thing. I didn't hear a word he said because I, could, I couldn't believe they would let a guy talk to like a hundred people who didn't know what he was talking about. So when the meeting was over, I went out and my sponsor said to him, and I couldn't believe I had to sit there. I didn't want to sit there. I wanted to leave. And my sponsor said to me, he says, so how'd you think, what would you think of the speaker? He's good. He says, he said, he, 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 he's an idiot. He doesn't know anything. I said, well, what do you mean? He says, he said that he was a recovered alcoholic. And my sponsor said, well, you are. I said, well, no, no, I'm recovering. Now he says, Russell, read the book. I said, what do you mean? He said, read the book. He says, it says, we are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a hopeless sense of mind, state of mind and body. And I looked at the book and it was right there recovered because he apparently had like 25 years. He had read the book, apparently. <laughs> and uh, I didn't hear a word he said because of my attitude. Now, my attitude, I wasn't like a bad guy. No, that's wrong. I was going to say I wasn't a bad guy. I am a bad guy. I don't think I'm a bad guy. I think I'm a nice guy. But my attitude is a crappy, know-it-all, self-seeking, selfish, closed-minded, arrogant attitude. And it's not, it, it's not that it's bad or good. It's just, it, it's just that's an alcoholic that describes that's a certain description of an alcoholic personality. He says our chief characteristic is defiance. I said every every negative attribute that will hurt me in life and allow me to hurt other people that I had, you guys have. There ain't nothing I'm going to say about me that you guys don't have a piece of it. You understand? That's the nature of the attitude. And and uh, I'm driving my, my my sponsor. How do you get rid? Of, and you know some I don't need to. I don't. What would you call that? I mean, if, I'm glad we have the word alcoholic because that sort of sums it up if you're an alcoholic. There should be another word that asshole. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. What do you call a person? Narcissistic, arrogant, idiot. I mean, I don't know. You know, I'm not putting you guys. I'm talking about myself. But, but uh, I'm, I'm sitting. I'm. I'm uh, it's a bad deal. 
Alcoholics are nasty. They're nasty to other people. They hurt other people. They rip their hearts out. They don't even know. They don't even care. You know, all they do is think about themselves. You know, I got a flat tire. I'm bitching about I can't believe this has happened to me. I can't freaking believe this has happened to me. You can be sitting there dying of terminal cancer. You can have, you can, you can be stage four breast cancer sitting as a passenger in my car and I'm saying, I can't believe what's happening to me. You know, he says, well, I got cancer. I said, yeah, but look at my flat. You know what I mean? I mean, I am whatever, whatever, whatever quality you need to have to make you a crummy human being. If you're an alcoholic, I got it. Guilty as charged, okay? And on the other hand, I think I'm the greatest thing since Swiss cheese. You know, I think I'm great, and I'm going to defend myself, you know, at all costs, you know? Seldom right, but never in doubt. I can tell you that. So so then uh, I, uh, I'm i driving with my sponsor. I mean, this is me. This is my attitude. I don't have to go to meetings to cop it. I, believe me, I don't need to go to meetings to hurt people have a shitty attitude. It comes so naturally. As a matter of fact, it's comfortable. I'm comfortable. I'm uncomfortable adapting a decent, gracious attitude. So I'm driving my car with my sponsor. I'm about seven, eight months sober. And we're going to go pick up Bobby, who was a guy, my sponsor also. He was like one of my litter mates. He sponsored me and Bobby. I picked up a white chip and never drank yet. Bobby, every, every 30 days, would drink. And he would, say, he would be good for like 15, 20 days. Then around 25, day 25, he'd say, I'm coming up on that time again. He was like on a timer. It was, like, I'm coming up on that time again. He says, Russ, you're an alcoholic, but I'm an alcoholic, and I have that 30-day thing. You know what I mean? Coming out at that time. And he'd be good, and then on the 29th day, we come 30 days, he's gone. And he'd wind up in bark or be arrested, and we'd go up, and we would get him every 30 days, and he'd say, he'd be remorseful, and say, this is going to happen again, he's going to do it differently. And my sponsor, you know, Bob, would pick up Bobby and me, and we'd take, we'd take him down, he'd give him, you know, a place to stay, We'd take him around to meetings, and Bobby would be good for like 29 days, and then goodbye. You know, he'd be off the And we did this four, five, six times. And I'm watching this going on. I'm watching this deal, you know. I'm watching it. You know, I'm, I'm taking names and notes, you know, photographs, videos, you know. And, and uh, it's pissing me off, you know, because this guy is, besides being, I mean, the truth is he's a phony baloney. He's a liar. He's a manipulator. You know, essentially everything I am. You know what I mean? But, but you know, he's a lying, manipulated, phony, self-centered, you know, alcoholic who doesn't give a crap about anybody, and he's hurting my sponsor. I can see he's hurting my sponsor because my sponsor's trying to help him, and my sponsor, he's got like 20 years, but he's too stupid to see what's really going on. <laughs> you see? And I have to protect my sponsor because I love my sponsor, you know? And so we're driving up one day. You understand what I'm saying? And... uh and let me tell you something. When you when you live your life in hatred, you know how you, you know when you live your life in hatred when you're thinking of murdering people all the time. <laughs> hey, listen, there ain't no probation in my, my I don't have such a thing as probation. You cut me up in traffic, it's death. It's not even death. I'll kill you, resurrect you, and kill you again. <laughs> I chop your head off, I kill you, I resurrect you, and then I chop your kids' heads off. In front of you, before you, I just don't like killing you before you suffer. You can't suffer enough if you piss me off. You know what I mean? I'm sure, you guys laugh. You don't know what it's like. You don't know how many people I have killed for minor indiscretions. You know what I mean? You know, I just like wiping them out, boiling them in oil, all sorts of stuff. You know what I mean? It's a good thing I don't have the power. Believe me, it's a real good thing I'm not president. It would be a real bad deal for everybody with these executive orders and everything, you know? You know, you guys would be in big trouble laughing at me like that, you know? So, you know, I mean, I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm, I'm upset because of what Bobby is doing. And so we're driving up, and I'm saying to my sponsor, I said, you know, you ought to turn this car around. He said, what? He says, and I start laying into him. I say, you know, this guy's a phony. He did this last month. He did it the month before. I'm giving him three-by-five cards. I've got evidence. You know, I'm a lawyer. I'm mapping out. I'm giving, him, I'm giving him an open statement. I've got, I've got, I mean, I've got the proof. I mean, this is not bullshit. This is reality. This guy has every 30 days. We've been doing it for six months. He's never done, you know, we ought to turn this thing. God, oh, he doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about me. He doesn't care about anything. We ought to turn this car around. And, I'm, you know, now... You know, I'm doing, now I'm like my own lynch mob. I'm getting really, ooh, I'm getting, and the more I talk, and then I do what alcoholics do, I'm repeating myself over and over again, I'm getting louder. And my sponsor, 
And I'm like eight months sober, you know. I'm eight months some. I'm eight, I don't know sober. I'm eight months something, you know what I mean? I'm something, you know. Whatever it is, you know. I, I got eight months of it. I'm eight months without a drink, okay. And uh, and whatever it is when you have alcoholism, but you're not whatever whatever it is. I, I'm eight months. I'm 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 I'm, in, I, I'm an alcoholic without drinking eight months is what I am, okay? And uh, and it's really upsetting me and I'm going crazy and you know and I'm and, and my sponsor turns to me and he says he's, finally I li- I like tucker myself out. I'm I'm yelling and screaming, I just I run out of words or something. And he says to me, he says, Are you done? And I said I looked at him and I said, yeah. He says, no, no, because I wasn't. I was still in my mind. It's like the locomotive, you know, it's going. He says, are you done? He says, yeah. He says, no, no, are you done? I said, yeah, I'm done. I'm done. He says, he says, are you, are you finished? He says, I'm finished. I'm finished. I mean, what is he going to say? I mean, I was so right. I was out right. If you disagree with me, you must, if you disagree with me, you must die because you're so stupid. You know what I mean? And uh, he looks at me. And he says, Russell. I said, what? He says, Russell. He says, what? What? This is what he says to me. It doesn't bother me like it bothers you. (laughs) And I look at him. Because he might as well have been talking Swahili to me. (laughs) And I say, how could it not bother you? Everything bothers me. Everything bothers. I was stark raving. So I asked one of, my, one of my sponsors once, Joe Snyder, I said, you ever get resentments? He said, get them. I give them. <laughs> I didn't understand that. Because if somebody didn't like me or if I thought you want to kill me, just come up to me and says, you wouldn't believe what they said about you last night. Just make me think that somebody's thinking a bad thought about me anywhere on the planet Earth. And I'm going to have to track that son of a bitch down, beat the shit out of him and make him <laughs> like me. You know, tell me, what did I do? You know? <laughs> I'm sorry, you know. I said I was sorry. <laughs> Nine years sober, something happened. Who knows what it was? It rained. Who the hell cares, you know? <laughs> Some people need an excuse to drink. I drink because I'm awake, you know what I mean? Awake is painful enough for me. It's as good as it is. You know, when you're an alcoholic, you don't need anything to happen. The world. Somebody cut me off. There was traffic. It was a Wednesday. Who cares? You know what I mean? You know, I mean, uh, some, uh, some, whatever. You know, some guy sitting there. He's thinner than me. Who knows? Who cares? Whatever it is, life was, it was a bad deal. I get into a fight with my wife. Probably because she said something. I don't know. Something. She said she started talking, you know? You know, she disrespected me. Who knows, you know? And, uh, I get on the phone with my, my, my sponsor. I'm nine years sober now. I've been doing the steps like this for six years at meetings. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm, I've been secretary of the group. I've heard been intergroup representative. I chaired the intergroup banquet twice, you know, and then, you know. I mean, I'm doing the deal and I'm nuts. I'm doing the deal in nine years and I'm nuts, nine, ten years, and I'm still stark raving crazy. Only I'm crazier at a higher level. You understand what I'm saying? A more advanced craziness, a subtler craziness, that doesn't come out so much in meetings, you know what I mean? Just a different kind, a different level of craziness. You know, like if this was like a video game, I'd make it like the tenth level, the tenth level, you know, or something like that. But crazy at this level. And uh, so I, uh, I get, <laughs> so I got on the phone with my sponsor Joe, and I start ripping into him about my wife and how she said this and how she did that because she was, you know, because she was doing crap. She was no, let me tell you something. She was doing stuff. She was doing stuff, you know. You know, I'm gonna tell you something. You know, you know, you know. Remember that first meeting? Remember that first meeting over at the uh, uh, South Dixie Room, where those guys went? She was doing shit like that. It was, it was, it had, whatever it was. It was like that kind of stuff. Whatever that stuff was, that was, she was doing that stuff. You know. Remember Bobby? You know Bobby, the guy who kept on drinking. I don't know what she, my wife was doing, but it was something like that stuff. You know, it was like bothering. You know, she was doing stuff. You know that guy who said, "I." Uh, you remember that guy who said, "I'm a recovered alcoholic." Now, I don't know what she was doing, but it was probably something like that, you know? It was something like that and all the other stuff that people do that piss you off, you know what I mean? You know, because if you're an alcoholic, you know, you ever notice, like, you take things personally, you know? Well, of course I'm taking things personally. I'm the most important thing in the world, and everything has to do with me, 
You get pissed off at your bad shit that doesn't even have anything to do with you. You get pissed, you know, something happens on the other side of the world, you take it personally. You know what I mean? You take it you just, you just feel, I've never seen anybody in the universe that feels, that, that feels disappointment like I feel disappointment. I've never seen anybody in the universe that feels self-righteousness and feels like, you know, feel, feels the way, looks the way I feel inside. I mean, I really, I'm a sensitive feeling guy. I mean, I worry about stuff. I'm feeling, you know, and that kind of stuff. And she just did stuff. She did something. I maybe, I told her not to do something. She did it. Or maybe she argued with me. Or maybe she said, who cares? You know what I mean? I mean, why did I marry this bitch in the first place? I mean, what's the point of staying married? And so I called my sponsor, because that's what you're supposed to do, because I still had that thing I didn't want to drink, which is very helpful to have, by the way, they're not drinking me. And I told him about everything she did. I told him, I gave him chapter and verse, you know, just like in the car. Remember with the South Dixie, uh, South Dade room? I told, I told, she said this, and I said that, and she said this, and I said that, and she did this, and I said that, and I told him the whole deal, you know? And after I was done, he said to me, he said this. You ready for this? He said, I'll tell you, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, bend his ear about everything she did. Man, and I'm telling you, if you, if I told you what she did, I don't know how many of you guys sponsor people, you know? I'm a bad, I'm a terrible sponsor, by the way. I'm going to tell you this right now, I'm a terrible sponsor. You know, my guys, they can start with this shit, my, start with this shit, they get like 30 seconds. <laughs> third, third, right, right, James? You get 30 seconds. Well, I said, I don't want to hear this bullshit, you know what I mean? Go kill yourself or drink, but you're fucking killing me, you know what I mean? I don't want to hear this shit, you know? But, but anyway, I had, I had like nice sponsors. Some my sponsors were nicer than me, you know? They would abuse me from time to time. So I tell him all this crap, you know? And, and he says to me this, he says, he says, uh, so you ready for this? Now this, they ask you sponsors, they ask you stupid questions. I think that when they get about 20, 30 years, they get stupid. Like, sort of like the way I am now. I mean, I'm just dumb. You know, I don't know. I must be dumb because all my sponsees say, you don't understand. So, I mean, I, I obviously, there's something wrong with me, you know. And uh, so, uh, uh, so my sponsor says to me, after I'm done laying this on all this stuff, and I'm upset, and I'm the one who's going crazy. And he says, do you know what, so why are you upset? I said, what do you mean, why am I upset? I says, do you know why you're upset? I said, what do you mean, do I know why I'm upset? He says, do you know why I'm ups you're upset? And I go, John, I just spent 15, 20 minutes telling you exactly what she did, exactly what she said, exactly what happened, exactly why I'm upset. And he then said to me this, he said, I mean, you know why you're upset, right? When you're upset, don't you know why you're upset? Listen, I can tell you one thing. You may not know much, but I promise you, I promise you this. If you're an alcoholic and you've ever been upset, the one thing you know is why you're upset, right? I want you to imagine this. When was the last time you were upset? You think about the last time you were upset. Did you know why you were upset? Right? That's why I said, I said, I just told you why I was upset. And he says this to me. He says, that's not why you're upset. <laughs> I'm giving you guys like advanced AA now. And this is shit you never know anywhere else. I said, what do you mean? He says, that's not why you're upset. I said, that's not why I'm upset. He says, no, that's not why you're upset. How many times have you told somebody that you're upset? How many times in your life? 10,000, 20,000, you're upset until the end. Did telling people why you're upset, did that, that ever fix the deal? That doesn't fix it, does it? You yelled and you screamed and everything like that. You feel like you got it off your chest until the next time. You just kept on getting upset, right? In other words, you just got upset a lot, but you... You didn't change. You didn't change. You stayed a thumb sucking cry bit. So he says, that's not why you're, see, I'm in here to change. You know, in the big book, you know what it says? It says, ideas, emotions, and attitudes 
that are the driving force of these men's lives are shifted off to one side and they become dominated by a whole new set of ideas, emotions, attitudes. It's like you can live in the first South Day room where they're all worthless, crummy pieces of shit. Or you can live the rest of your life in the second South Day room where it's the greatest meeting in the world. You can be in the meeting with the idiot that doesn't know anything about alcoholism and you got to sit there and listen to this bullshit. Or you can be in the room where you're listening to the greatest speaker in the world. See, you can be in a crummy marriage married to this bitch or this guy and why the hell am I doing here? Or you can be married to the greatest woman or the greatest man in the world. You got your choice. Of what You could be driving to pick up a drunk, you understand, and thinking it's the biggest bunch of bullshit and think he's a phony baloney and that you're wasting your time. Or you could be driving to pick up a drunk and thinking you're in God's will and be grateful. You could, you could do this thing any way you want. You know, it has nothing to do with drinking. You can live, this is, this is not like a dress rehearsal. This is your life. You can live your life like a selfish, self-centered, thumb-sucking, crybaby, two-year-old alcoholic, or you can be one of the men, you know, the men and the boys, you know, you can be one of the men, you know, where you learn to be content, like the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 4, Philippians 4.11, I love the way he says, he says, I've learned the secret. It's 2,000 years ago he said this. He says, I've learned the secret. I've learned to be content in all things and under all circumstances, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in jail or not. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It doesn't matter what my outward circumstances are. It doesn't matter how much money I have in the bank. It doesn't matter whether I have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or I'm having sex or not having sex or whether I'm being mistreated or I'm treated properly, it doesn't matter. My attitude and feelings about myself doesn't change. You know, it's like that guy said to Bill Wilson. He says, he said, I knew there was something more, something I hadn't got. You know, I, they had this release, this happiness that I thought a person ought to have. They talk about it in the big book and the promises that you're going to know a new freedom. You're going to know a new happiness. They give you some examples. You know, no matter how far down you've gone, you're going to see where you can help people. You're not going to feel sorry for yourself. You're going to lose fear of today, tomorrow, the year after. You're going to be reborn. You're going to lose fear of people and of economic insecurity. You're going to, you'll, you, you know, if you make a decision for him, all sorts of remarkable things will happen. He says, if you stay close to him and perform his works well, you're going to learn, lose concerns about your own little plans and designs. You're going to start being more concerned about other people. You know, it tells you all this incredible stuff that's going to happen. That's the deal. Nine years sober, I still hadn't gotten it. I still hadn't figured it out. It, there was, there still wasn't, I'm sure there was some changes and different changes, but I was still, he, he says, he says, that's not why you're upset. I said, that's not why I'm upset. He said, no, that's not why you're upset. And then he shut up. You know, because he, he was brilliant. He shut up. He didn't say a word. Because he knew if he had told me why I was upset, I would have told him he was full of crap. You know, because I'm an alcoholic and I'm defiant. You know, I tell people they're stupid. And, you know, they don't know what they're... So he didn't say anything. He says, that's not why you're upset. So if you're sitting there and your sponsor, after you lay this all on him, says, that's not why you're upset, and then shuts up. And you say, that's not why I'm upset. And he says, no, that's not why you're upset. Like he knows the secret. So what do you think you're going to do? So I said to him, I said, that's not why I'm upset. He said, no, that's not why you're upset. I said, well, you're going to tell me why I'm upset? So he goes, do you really want to know? <laughs> he, he likes, wants me to beg, you know. That way, if I get mad, he can say, you asked. You asked me, you know what I mean? You know? When somebody says, my, my husband or so-and-so is in trouble, I say, have him call me. Well, can you call him? I say, no, have him call me. Because when he yells and screams and tells me I'm full of shit, I want to say, I want to give me the ability to say, listen, buddy, you called me. I didn't call you. You called me. I didn't call you. You know? Give me the ability. i got to have something on the alky. 
You know what I mean? You know, because he thinks he's so self-important. He thinks that, like, he's worth, he's, like, worth, like, he's doing me a favor talking to me. He said, that's not why I'm upset. He says, do you really want to know? I said, well, of course I want to know. Why am I upset? He says, listen, stupid. He always talked to me in that loving sort of way, you know. He said, that's exactly what he said. He said, listen, stupid. He said, because then now, now I'm listening, you know. He says, you're upset because you're upsetable. It's like Zen AA or something. Like that. You're upset because you're upsetable. So my wife, you know, hasn't changed much. She's the same deal. You know, I mean, AA hasn't changed much. My sponsees haven't changed much. They're doing the same thing that, you know, Bobby was doing the bomb. You know? I'm not sure when I realized that none of this stuff was bothering me anymore. You know, uh, you know, they have a spiritual accident whenever you're disturbed. You know, the truth is, when he told me at nine years, you're upset because you're upsetable. It's what's going on inside of you. It's a problem, it's the disease inside of you. That's why you're upset. When he said that, he was actually saying the same exact thing to me that my sponsor said to me at three months. When I was driving the car up to Bobby, and I went through that whole long, ah, yeah, ah, mm, and he looked at me and he said, this is what it said. He said, Russell, it doesn't bother me like it bothers you. It doesn't upset me like it upsets you. You're upset because you're upsetable and you allow things to upset you. Things that, that upset you do not upset me. You know, he had that new freedom. He had that new happiness. You know, he had that deal going on. He had learned to be content in all things. You know, no matter what was going on his life and how he felt about himself and how, about, how he felt about things, no longer depended upon the external circumstances of his life. You know, it depended on something that was going on. In, see, inside for me, I was all over the place. I was like the double-minded man. I was here, I was there, I was up, I was down. You know, if you're an alcoholic, you know, one day you're high. Then one, you're high, you're low, you're high, you're low. That's like the first hour, you know what I mean? You're up, you're down. I'm a winner, I'm a loser, I'm employed, I'm fired. I love this job, I hate this job, you know? You know, I can't be employed, I'm unemployed. They're paying me too, they're screwing me. I mean, it's always, it's always, you win, you lose. The joy of victory, the agony of defeat. It's always, I'm great, I'm bad. It's not like no in-between. In-between is like boring. You know? I mean, feeling sorry for yourself and suicidal is just as good as feeling great about yourself and better than everybody. It's got to be one of the two. It can't be in between because that's like nothing's going on. You know what I mean? I don't feel like I'm alive unless I'm killing somebody or hating somebody or looking. If I'm not in trouble, I'm looking for the trouble. I'm looking for the depression. You know? You know, I'm, I'm the guy. Let me hook up with the worst person I could probably hook up with because, you know, I... I you know, I like that gal. She excites me when she tries to stab me with a knife. It's like, you know, it's somebody, she's got like a personality, you know what I mean? <laughs> At least she's got a personality, you know what I mean? Um, so that's what, the, so, so, you know, how do you, so here's the deal. Nine years in Alcoholics Anonymous. Look, I'm just talking about my own. You know, I say things to people. It doesn't go over being in AA rooms, but I, you know, I say things based upon my experience. I say, you know, how you get, you know, I wanted, I wanted to have 30 years. I wanted to have the thing the 30 year guys had. And, uh, look, nobody's perfect. You know, there's probably things that still upset. You know, I get upset, you know, you know, I'll, you know, twice a week for three minutes, you know, whatever. And then it's, you know, I mean, it's over. But it's not like the way it used to be. You know what I mean? It's not like, it's not like, uh, you know, like I hang on to things for four days and three weeks. I go to 15 meetings and a, and a psychiatrist and sucking my thumbs and I'm tossing and turning and I can't get to sleep and I'm worried about what happened last Tuesday and how it's going to affect, you know, it's not like that to you, you know what I mean? <laughs> three minutes, twice a week, you know, pissed off and then forget about it, move on, you know? You know, you, you understand what I'm saying? It's a whole different deal. It's a whole different freedom. And, uh, you know, that, so how does this, so how does this, you know, play in, you know, I've been, I've been working on this thing for nine years. I tell people, 
you know, they'll tell me about a problem they're having. And maybe they'll have eight, nine, ten, twelve years. I say, hey, listen, that's going to go away. He says, really? Yeah, 20, 25 years. <laughs> they look at me like I'm crazy because alcoholics, you know how I used to make things go away? You know how I used to make things go away? Whack. Maybe whack, whack. I drank fast. I was a fast drinker. Because I drank for the effect. I drank for the effect. You see, if you're feeling sorry for yourself, you're feeling lonely, you're feeling anything, whack, whack, five seconds, you're done. I was, I, as I was pulling up to the bar, I was feeling better. You know? I want, listen to what I want. Buy, you want to feel better? Buy a blouse. Change your hair color. You know what I mean? Lose some weight. You know, do, do whatever, but whatever it is, do it. Pop a pill, smoke a joint, do something, go to the movies, do something external that's fast, that can get you to like, but you see the problem is that's not the cure. That's all that, all you're doing is you're di diverting your attention from the sorry, shitty condition you're in. And then as soon as you get out of the movie, and as soon as the, the new suit wears off, you know, as soon as you do, as, long, as soon as you overspend the money that you don't have to buy things you don't even need to impress people you don't even like, as soon as you get the new car and the new car payments come in, as soon as you do all that stuff, you know what I mean? One day the car is two days old, you know, or it has a flat tire, and you're back in the shits again, upset and crappy with the same old crap, but this time with car payments. You know what I mean? And broke. You know, and you just can't, and you, so how do you change this thing when you're used to changing how you feel and your attitude in five nanoseconds with a drink or a drug or a joint or something like that? When, and then you go up to some sponsor and it tells you you're going to be fine, it's going to be great in about 20 years. <laughs> that separates the men from the boys, doesn't it, you know? But that's the truth. Perseverance. And then you look at the book of James. And you look at the book of James. That's when you go to the book of James, which is the source material. Where James, the apostle James, that's the source material. We, we almost call the book, it says, it says rejoice. This is the book of James, chapter one. Rejoice when you have trials of many kinds. In other words, when you're going through the shits and things are horrible and Bobby's getting drunk, you know what I mean? And the guy, the speaker is an idiot and your wife is treating you like crap. Rejoice. Rejoice. Say, man, this is it. Incredible. This is great. <laughs> it's great. It's great. You know, you'll believe when you tell yourself. You tell yourself it's shitty, it's shitty. It says it's great. It says rejoice when you have trials of many kinds, because when you this is what it says, when you persevere, when you endure, when you endure through trials, without the drinking, the drugging, the spending, the gossiping, the doing all the crap that you do, and you focus on God, what it does is it strengthens your faith, and this is all about faith. That's the big one. It's all about faith. I'm going to prove it to you in a second. You strengthen your faith. And when you strengthen your faith, you sit through that endurance, you become somebody who can withstand you change. That's what changes you. That's the change. The, the, the things that you think are the worst things in your life, let me tell you something. The things that where, where you don't suffer consequences, where you don't suffer pain, where you're, I don't know if you've ever known a spoiled brat, when everything goes right for you and you never have a problem, that turns you into the worst human being on the planet Earth. When you are having the crap beat out of you, and while you're having the crap beat out of you, while you're bored, while you're broke, while you're doing this, you're persevering here, and you're trusting in God, and you're helping other people anyway, and you're going to meetings, and you're trucking through anyway, and not only you're not drinking, you're trying to do the right thing. When you do that, that's what makes you the guy with 20, 25 years that says it doesn't bother me like it bothers you. That's what does it. But the problem is most alcoholics don't want to do that deal because they want a pill. They want the shortcut, the shortcut. That's what they want to do. That's the deal. And that's what the, that's what James says. And then it goes on to say, he says, but, but you have to have faith. And it's got to be faith without doubt because when you have faith without doubt, you're a double-minded man living a double-minded life. You can be tossed and turned this way and that way and you'll receive nothing. You know what the big book says? It says if you don't change, it says the result is nil until you let go absolutely. Now here's what it says. Perhaps there is a better way. We think so. For we are now on a different basis, the basis of trusting and relying upon God. We trust infinite God rather than our finite selves. We are in the world to play the role he assigns just to the extent that we do as we think he would have us and humbly rely on him 
does he enable us to match calamity with surrender? We never apologize to anyone for depending upon our creator. We can laugh at those who think spirituality is a way of weakness, paradoxically is a way of strength. The birth of the ages is that faith means courage. All men of faith have courage. They trust their God. We never apologize for God. Instead, we let him demonstrate through us what he can do. We ask him to move our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be at once we commence to outgrow fear. Now, you guys are all looking for the answer. Everybody here is looking, just like hate, just like, you know, Bill Dotson was. I knew there was something more. I knew there was something I hadn't got. The answer is right here in the book. It's in the Bible. It's been around for thousands. The answer is suffer, going through the suffering. You know, if you look at the seventh step, you know what it says in the seventh step? How's this one? He says we start to learn the value of suffering. The way we get a new perspective is by a hundred forms of, of, of humiliation and the final crushing of our self-sufficiency. By the way, you know how you got into Alcoholics Anonymous? You were crushed. You didn't get here because you were having a good time. You got here because it was the worst time. It was the worst. You thought it was the worst thing that ever happened to you in your life. And out of the worst thing that happened to you in your life, you ended up getting the best gift that you could possibly get in your life. And what makes you think it's going to be any different as you go along on the deal? It's all, and so you guys go to these discussion meetings complaining about all the crap that's happening to you, not understanding, not understanding that it's the crap that's happening to you that's going to save your life. And the reason you're complaining, and the only reason you're complaining, is you're looking at yourself, and you're looking at your world, and you're looking at your circumstances, and you're not looking at God. You're not looking at God. You don't believe. You don't have faith. You don't understand that no matter what's happening, it's all for your benefit, all for your discipline, all to change you and give you more faith. And we should be saying, thank you, God, for this cancer. Thank you, God, for this rope. Thank you, God, for everything, because you want to know something? I'm still sober, and look all the stuff I have, and I'm just going to believe in you that this is for a purpose. Instead of doing that, which is something a man or somebody who encourage you to do, you like to act like a five-year-old thumb-sucking crybaby and go to meetings and complain and whine like you did when you were in the bars drinking. And all you do is just delay the process. And most people in Alcox are just going to end up drinking anyway. They're not going to persevere. They're not going to make it anyway. And they'll never understand why, because they think this is all about, all about getting money, power, and prestige, and getting wonderfulness. And you got all sorts of movie stars who are getting all that stuff, and they're committing suicide and killing themselves. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with building character, perseverance, and faith in God. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.